Yeah, so as you may have noticed, this is, this is from your homework, and I want to do this as a demonstration regardless of whether you've already solved this problem. In fact, I hope that you've solved this problem because what I'd like you to do is to be able to think really deeply about it and show you my perspective on structure solving, and in particular, we're going to be talking about using HMBC as a very focused tool to help solve structures and specifically for the problem of putting the pieces together. You've seen on the templates that I've given you, I've had this tremendous emphasis, or at least I've tried to have this tremendous emphasis on thinking your way through the problem, reading the spectrum, getting the formula, writing out fragments, jotting down what you know, jotting down what you don't know if possible, and then being able to ask focused questions. HMBC is an incredibly data-rich technique. It also has ambiguities to it because we get two-bond and three-bond couplings. So you've got a huge amount of information, a huge amount of data. And what I'd like us to do today is to learn how to use it as a focus tool. So I want to zip through <coughs> the problem from Silverstein at the beginning and then focus on the HMBC angle. So this is... This is problem 8.43 from Silverstein. And I want to jot down my, you know, I've worked this problem just like you folks, and I want to jot down my, my impressions on working the problem. So I look, at, I look at this problem, and I generally start with if I have, I mean, what's the most useful thing you can get? Molecular formula and functional groups. That's sort of the most general stuff. And we'll be able to get the molecular formula in just a moment because we'll actually see all the hydrogens and all the carbons, so we basically will get them, get the oxygens by difference. So before we start with the NMR spectra, though, looking at the IR spectrum, I see what looks like an OH group. I see what looks like a carbonyl. At 1728, it's a little high for a typical ketone, right? A typical ketone's a little bit lower. It might be an ester. I've been emphasizing it's very hard in any sort of level of complexity to get CO single bond stretches associated with esters. It's probably hiding right here at 1188, so you sort of get a hint at it. But we'll see in a moment there are some other hints that are pointing, pointing toward ester. We probably have an alkene. That's probably an alkene CH. It could be an aromatic. We'll see in a moment it's not. That's probably an alkene CC bond. All right, mass spec, it's 200 molecular weight in the EI mass spectrum. What I'm going to do before we, before we actually get the formula, so maybe at this point I'll just jot down sort of a question mark on the IR spectrum, ester, sort of my thinking on this. All right, at this point, I want to go and look at the proton NMR, look at the carbon NMR, and I've really, really, really been emphasizing this notion of keeping the resonances separate from the atoms. In other words, we know resonances. It's something you can see. We're going to be assigning those resonances to the structure as we build the structure. And so we have a common language. I go ahead and I simply letter the peaks A, B, C, it's hard staring into the light, D, E, F, G, H, I, J. And we number the carbon resonances, and I'll go one, two, Three, that's our chloroform, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. I like to do a good job of working the integrals. My philosophy, every particular integral has experimental error associated with it. The best way that you can do it, if you know the number of hydrogens in the molecule or you know multiple hydrogens, is add up a bunch and divide by the number of hydrogens. If you don't, or you're in a hurry, often you can get it by inspection with a ruler. These integrals are a little hard to read. They're starting them right in the baseline. They're not offset. 
You can use a ruler and draw straight lines. You can slap a grid on it. I'm just using my ever, ever useful grid. And if I'm looking, I start to see a ratio that's just a hair under six, a hair under six, a hair under three, hair under three, hair under three. This one's just, just a little bit, actually this is just a hair under six, hair under nine. So basically, basically we're talking about like 2.8 uh, units. These happen to be tenths of an inch per hydrogen. This guy is interesting. He's coming up a little bit, this one right at 1.6 ppm, so he's coming up over 0.6, and I'll tell you about that in a second. And then we see one that's just a hair under 0.9, and another that's just a hair under 0.9. So you pretty much, by inspection, can go ahead and get, and again, it's really hard staring in here, 2H for A, 2H for B, 1H for C, 1H for D, 1H for E, 1H for F, Did I? 2H for F, thank you, 3H for G. Now, H is interesting, 1.6, this is in chloroform solution, and chloroform water typically shows up at about 1.6 parts per million. And so you can kind of see the water peak right over here. So you have this multiplet that's reasonably symmetrical, and then you have a little bit of water off on the side here. I would go in, if I were at my own spectrometer, I'd go in and zoom in and get a better, better look and see, but I think you can see the integral just gives a little extra kick up for the water. So H is 2H, I is 3, 3H, J is 3H. So in other words, our molecular formula has a total of H20 in it. Now it's certainly possible if I had an amine or something that the amine NH might not show up or an alcohol NH. So I'm not immediately locking in, and this is really important. You have to be keeping your wits about you. Secondary amine NH is aliphatic. Secondary amine NHs are terribly hard to see. Alcohols can be broad. Alcohols can be with the water peak. Carboxylic acids can be, can be broad as well and can be disappeared, uh, particularly if you're in chloroform versus DMSO due to exchange. If we look at the carbon NMR here, peak number one is at about 170, just a hair down of 170, about 173 ppm, where you would expect for an ester, not where you'd expect for a ketone. We've got a couple of peaks over here. If I want to go ahead at this point, I'll say one is a quat, two is a quat, looking at the depth. Three is a CH2, four is a quat, five is a CH2, six is a CH2, seven and eight are all CH2s, and then nine, 10, and 11 are all CH3s. So basically, if we do this, we see we have C11H20. If we have symmetry in the molecule, which you've gotten in a couple of homework problems this week, of course you might end up with a count that's lower if, you, if your carbons aren't all different. Or you could have overlapping peaks, but symmetry is a typical reason. If you have a plain phenyl group, you're going to see four carbon peaks, but you're going to have six carbons. If you have a ring like a cyclopropane ring and there's no stereocenter in the molecule, you may, if you have one point of attachment, have two methylenes that are the same. But if I look here, I'm suspecting an alcohol, I'm suspecting an ester, I have 200. If I take away C12, uh, C11, and H20 from that, I get O3. So I'm reasonably happy at this point. I think I have a molecular formula. Now, the next thing I do with a molecular formula is I'll start to, start to and it's nice to have a, a scorecard here. So I might, for example, over here, jot down some thoughts, ester, alcohol, alkene, as some of, the, some of the groups that we're seeing in the molecule. 
If I want, I can calculate degrees of unsaturation, another very useful thing. Remember, I don't do it by formula. I just say C11 would be H24. I'm at H20, so we have two degrees of unsaturation. So I can help keep my wits about me. That also tells me if I have a carbonyl and I have an alkene, I know I have no rings in the molecule. All right, now the next place, I'll, any questions or thoughts at this point? Does it? Let's see. And this is actually a good point in checking yourself. I have an incredible ability to screw up arithmetic on my feet, which, mean, which means go ahead and, and double, double no, check yours. I think you're All right. Uh, C, can that be the OH? C could indeed be the OH. So we've got some interesting points here you can already see. So if you're reasonably experienced, I'm going to bet anything that we have a stereocenter in the molecule. Now, even though I haven't measured the coupling constants, I could measure the coupling constants. They very conveniently give me a scale here, and you'd get a peak printout. But very conveniently, a typical aliphatic CH coupling constant is about 7 hertz. A methyl group next to a methylene is really very typical for this. You'll, a methyl group next to just about anything is going to give you about 7 hertz. So immediately, if I'm eyeballing this, even if I don't know I'm at 600 megahertz, and I see this triplet here, that's obviously a CH3 next to a CH3 next to a CH2. In fact, I can write this as one of my fragments here, because I think we're, we're pretty obvious at that point for this and this here. But if I'm looking at that, I see, OK, these guys are leaning into each other. We have an AB pattern. It's obviously a big coupling constant. This separation is at least twice the separation in the triplet. So it's like a 14 hertz or 15 hertz coupling constant. That is very typical for a geminal coupling. So in the back of my mind, I'm thinking stereocenter, something with a methylene that's diastereotopic. If I have a stereocenter, every methylene in the molecule is going to be diastereotopic, but usually the ones that are further from the stereocenter behave as if things are coincident. So we look here, we have what looks like an ethyl group. It wouldn't have surprised me to see a more complicated coupling pattern for this ethyl group. But it doesn't necessarily surprise me to see a less coupling constant. I'm pretty sure this uh, a less complicated coupling pattern just to see a plain old quartet. I'm pretty certain I have an ethyl ester at this point. Pretty confident I have an ethyl ester because that sure looks like an OCH2, CH3 off of an ethyl ester. But it could be something else that's shifting it downfield. All right, at this point, it's time to get analytical. And where I like to go next is actually the HMQC rather than the COSY. As I was saying in discussion the other day, the problem is you're drowning in data in a COSY quite often. And a lot of the data isn't particularly useful. You'll have two diastereotopic protons. And they'll both couple to another two diastereotopic protons, or even to one, one proton. And you're getting more information than you need, because you'll get that the diastereotopic protons are coupling with each other. OK, but big whoop. You'll get that each one's coupling to one of the protons. All right, that gives you some new information, but that's redundant. And if you have two diastereotopic protons coupled to two diastereotopic protons, now you've got lots and lots of data points that basically just tells you you have a CH2 next to a CH2. So in order to help make sense of the data, I go next to the HMQC. And I'm very, very rigorous about trying to transcribe stuff. And I'm not super neat, but I tend to really try to be analytical. So I'm going to copy all of my numbers here. to the carbon axis. And I'll copy all of my letters to the proton axis.
And at this point, again, a grid is extremely useful. If you're working on your own spectrometer, you might want to do an expansion. You might want to want to expand this region just so you can get a close look and see what's lining up. But if you're having trouble following with your eye and things aren't completely obvious, slapping a grid on the spectrum is a very useful way, for example, to see that this peak at 9 here is actually crossing with the singlet. So we have two methyls that are right next to each other. One of those methyls is a singlet. One of them is a triplet. And so you can very nicely see that 11 is crossing with I and, 10 and 9 is crossing with J. And then we can go and 10 is crossing with H, I believe. And again, I'm going to cheat a little bit because 10 is crossing with G. I'm going to cheat a little bit because it's hard staring in here. And it looks like 7 is crossing with H. And then F, it looks like, is crossing with 8. And let's see. 6 is crossing with D and E, so 6D and 6E. And it looks like 5 is crossing with B. C has no partner, and it looks like 3 is crossing with A. And this information here really becomes my Rosetta Stone. It really becomes the key piece of information that I'm going to be using now in building the structure because now that's going to give us all of our easy connectivities. And you need to keep your wits about you about chemical shift as well. So, you know, obviously if we're talking a carbonyl, we're probably talking one is a carbonyl. If we're talking about an alkene, we're probably talking about two and three being the alkene. And it looks like 3 is a quat carbon of an alkene, and 2 is a CH2 of an alkene. So it looks like we have a gem, gem dimethyl group here. 4 and 5 are interesting. Remember, the region, your, your carbon protons track pretty well with your proton scale. And if you're next to, not so well on halogen or nitrogen, those tend to be sort of, if you're next to halogen or nitrogen, those tend to be here. But if you're next to an oxygen, you usually tend to be somewhere around here in the 50 to 90 range, depending on whether it's an OCH3 at one extreme or, say, a carbon that's a quat with an alcohol at another extreme. If you're down further than that, it could be two oxygens on a carbon, or it could be an alkene, or it could be a nitrile. Okay, so it looks like we probably have a couple of carbons with an oxygen attached to them. Number five is a CH2, and number three, as I said, was a CH2. Four is a quat, two is a quat, one is a quat. Quats and other things that are isolated are going to be problems later on. So if you look at this spectrum, we have 7H and 9J that don't show, that are, are close to singlets. And we'll see 7H is going to come in. We have C that has nothing on it, and so we're going to have to, have to deal with him. OK, now at this point, I'm prepared to go to my cozy. This particular cozy, the way they plotted it in the book to save space or allow you to give give bigger spectra, they, um, they only plotted the axis on one edge. And that's OK, because you can just bounce, bounce up and over and then up. Otherwise, I'd just be bouncing up and up to that axis. However you want to do it is, is fine. All right, so now, as I said, I'm ready to attack my cozy. And the first thing I'm going to do is, again, very slavishly transcribe. So I have 3A and 5B and C. And you really don't want to make a mistake at this point. 6D, 6E, 8F, 
10G. The other nice thing, in addition to having it so that we all can discuss things together, the other very nice thing about taking this sort of meticulous systematic approach to, to this in 9J here, the other thing about taking this sort of meticulous systematic approach is it means that you can set down the problem, come back to it later, and get your bearings a lot more quickly because it's not just, oh, we've got a lot of stuff. It's actually, oh, I've got this resonance and I still don't know where, it's, where it goes. All right, at this, at this point, we want to, want to sort of build up our fragments, and I'm going to look at the cozy. You can use a grid, you can draw straight lines on it, whatever, whatever you like. If you want, want a grid, you can do it this way. If you're fancy and you like to work off the online problems, in Acrobat, the command U, if you're using a full version, I'm not sure about the reader, Command U actually just slaps a grid right on the screen, which is useful. And you can even, there are parameters in Acrobat to set how fine a, a grid. But it's helpful, with, particularly with the book problems, where they tend to be less generous with the expansion. So at this point, I tend to go through and just, just list all of my cross peaks. So if, I, if I'm working up, and I only need to work on one side of the diagonal, it should be pretty symmetrical. But if you're uncertain whether anything is noise, check if it's on both sides of the diagonal. If you're working on the spectrometer, you can go down a level or up a level with the times two or divided by two or the slider. And you're going to get down to a level where you have two types of things. At the very bottom, you'll just have a basement of noise, particularly in data poor experiments. But you'll also have artifact baseline role. Your phasing is very important in the 2D experiments in terms of not getting a lot of crap off the baseline. So you really want to take time when you're phasing it to do a good job. OK, so we've got this peak 3, 3A to 10G. And it looks like we have something of 3A and 8F here. I'll put a little question mark there. I'm not completely sure what's going on. Well, of course, I'm sure what's going on. But at this point in analyzing the thing, I'm not sure. OK, this is kind of nice because you look here and you say, all right, yeah, we've got 6E, 6F. But I already know they're on the same carbon. It's no big deal. They're diastereotopic protons that are coupled to each other. OK, I don't need to stress about that. All right, 8F cross 7H, and I think that, that about does it. So at this point, I want to put together fragments. And this is what I'm using that. Oh, oh, here we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 5B, right. 5B to 11I, absolutely. 5B to 11I. And you notice you notice that you're using multiple sorts of tools in thinking about things. Because on the one hand, you're recognizing, when we just had the 1D data in front of us, you were recognizing the match of patterns and coupling constants. You were recognizing a three-hydrogen a three triplet upfield and a two-hydrogen quartet downfield, midfield, probably went together as an ethyl ester group. Because CH3 split into a triplet has to be next to a CH2. CH2 split into a quartet. Remember, it didn't have to be a quartet. But CH2 split into a quartet probably is next to a CH3. It could have been next to a CH2 and a CH where it had the same J value. So I don't know for sure. But now with this and everything else, I think I can be can be pretty sure. So let me, let me sort of jot down what I think I have at this point for my fragments. So I think I have OC5H2B, C11H3I as one fragment. And I like to use that way of doing it where I put the number on the carbon, the letter on the hydrogen. So this just means carbon 5 is part of a CH2 group with two protons B, and C11 is part of a CH3 group with three protons I. All right, what else do I have in my, in my scorecard here? Well, that C8H2F cross peak with C7 
H2H gives me another fragment. The other thing that I like to do in keeping score at this point is I like to show my valences. It helps my thinking to say, OK, I, that means I have a valence here. This helps me think about where my unfilled valences are. All right, what else do I have in my scorecard? I have an alkene. And it's C3HAHA. -H -A. If I were thinking about it, I might say maybe these are two distinct hydrogens here. If I later went on and I said, oh, wait, I thought they were one type of hydrogen, but they're two, and this is important to my analysis, all I'd need to do at this point is say, all right, we're going to call one of them A and one of them A prime. And the nice thing is you're not renumbering or relettering your whole spectrum if you suddenly say, oh, wait, this resonance is really two resonances. If I had decided that H was really two resonances, and of course H and F really are two resonances because you have a stereocenter and they're methylenes and they're diastereotopic methylenes. It's not like the cozy we saw in discussion section the other time where I was going on where we were talking about highly differentiated, highly anisotropic CH2 groups, but it's the same, same sort of deal. So if it were important, I could say H and H prime, F and F prime if I really started to see distinct cross peaks. But honestly, I don't. So this is absolutely fine for the analysis. OK, so I have C3. And then C3 seems to be bound to C2, which is a quat. And we have, we have this interesting sis situation here where we see this nice cross peak off of 10G, right? 10G is a methyl group. 10G is kind of at this position of about 1.7. Now remember I said I like to keep some numbers in my head, and my sort of quick and dirty is a benzylic methyl is 2, a methyl that's alpha to a carbonyl is 2 ppm, and a methyl that's allylic is about 2 ppm. And then I said, caveat, if you really want to keep an extra number in your head, keep 1.7 for that allylic methyl. So this is very typical of an allylic methyl. It's exactly what you'd expect for its position, and it's exactly the sort of thing that you would expect for allylic coupling. So C10. H3G comes here. And then this kind of makes sense of the cross peak. So right, we're seeing, we're seeing this cross peak here. We're seeing this little cross peak with 8. So if you want to, we'll get it from the HMBC if you don't want to do it. But if you want to get it at this point, it certainly makes a heck of a lot of sense that 3A is crossing with 8. So I can put this in. If you're uncertain about something, if you're uncertain about a connection, put it in with a dashed line. It's a great tool to remind yourself on your scorecard on working out the problem if you're worried or concerned about something. So at this point, we need to figure out the rest of our stuff. So let me continue, continue with our scorecard. We have a carbonyl, and that's our C1. I hope you can see this from, yeah, you're just about just about on the edge of the screen here. All right, so we have a carbonyl. We have some other, we have some other problems here. We have our C6HDHE, and I'll keep filling in my valences to be good about this, just to remind us that we have, have some issues of valences here. And then I have some carbon, and there may be redundancy here. I have some carbon that's connected to C9H3J, and that carbon has to be, be a quad. It has to be because we're isolating that methyl over here. And I have some other carbon. Remember, I have this carbon 4. And that carbon-4 is pretty far downfield in the C13 NMR spectrum. I, it's um, it's just, uh, just at about 70 parts per million. And that's, that's got to be a carbon next to an oxygen. 
All right, so at this point, that's, that's kind of my thinking. Now, certainly, certainly by brute force, you could now assemble these pieces. You would basically start to try all different possibilities, and eventually you'd probably come up with the right structure. I like this molecule because it's a simple enough molecule that you could, but what I'd like to show you now is how HMBC really lends this, makes this into a much more systematic, let us say, process. All right, so at this point, I'm going to pull up the HMBC spectrum, and we get a lot of cross peaks. Your textbook, as I've railed about, has doctored its HMBC spectra, so I have literally undoctored the HMBC spectra. What the textbook did, which I don't like, is it's taken out the HMQC type of cross peaks in the spectrum. There's no reason to do that. You should be able to identify these. You're going to see them in real data. The HMBC, we've talked about this notion of delays. We've talked about the idea that you're doing that what's basically a series of pulses and delays where your delays are optimized to different things, like coupling constants. So when we talked about our depth spectra last time, I said the problem with a depth spectrum is you're choosing, you have to choose a J value for the depth spectrum. You're going to choose a typical J value, and that's going to give an optimum performance at that J value. And guess what? If your J's aren't 145 hertz, if they're a little off, 125 hertz, 160 hertz, you'll be fine. But if they're a lot different, you'll start to see other things. Now, HMBC is optimized to small couplings. Small couplings typically mean on the order of 0 to 20 hertz. And the spectrum downstairs is sort of centered at 10, which pretty much catches it all. But that doesn't mean your one bond couplings that are 125 hertz may not sometimes come in. And so you can see your one bond couplings. The pulse sequence, remember in the depth how we turned on the proton decoupler in the final acquisition? In a typical HMBC, you're not turning on the proton decoupler in the final part of the acquisition, which means you're seeing your CH couplings. Now, most of those are two bond couplings, so most of those are on the order of um, two and three bond, so most of them are on the order of 10 hertz, which means, okay, when you're seeing something where your peak's a little bit wide, the peak's a little bit wide because you're seeing that coupling. But when you're picking up the one bond coupling, which is not what the experiment's supposed to pick up, it is extremely obvious. You get these sort of vampire bites around the peak. And so I just put a cross through each of them uh, to help remind me of what's going on, right? So this is peak number 11. And this is 11 over here is 11i. So those two vampire bites there are the one bond coupling. It's trivial. That's the information that's already in your HMQC spectrum, but it's confusing in this data-rich experiment. So let me go through and now systematically number 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, to one, I'll systematically number my carbon axis. I'll once again slavishly write my labels on the proton axis, 3A, 5B, C, 6D, 6E, 8F, 10G, 7H, I already did 11i and 9j. And you can pretty much see all of your sort of vampire bites here. There happen to be six pairs of them here. So we're getting one around five. That's your HMQC pattern. We're getting one around seven. That's your HMQC pattern. We're getting one around six. And we're getting, let's see, one around 10. 
and one around nine. All right, even without these types of information, you are still extremely data rich and the question becomes where to begin. Now if you're a computer, you just go ahead and suck in all the data and fit the pieces together that way. But as a person, you've got the tremendous strength that we've already seen of pattern recognition. We saw, we could read that ethoxy group in the ester. We could read the diastereotopic methylene. And you were seeing that from this whole host of little things with the diastereotopic methylene, from the big J value, from the peaks tenting into each other. It's the same way most of you were able to tackle those coupling problems on the midterm exam and just read and say, okay, this is this nitrobenzene, this is that nitrobenzene, this is this methylpyridine, because you were starting to recognize the magnitude of the coupling, the tenting of the peaks, and so forth. So you've got some tremendous advantages and yet we've also got this ability to, or this issue of how do we avoid confusion here. So usually what I like to do are to start with my problems and in general, my problems are going to be the isolated peaks. In general, it is the peaks that are isolated that are going to be both the tough ones to put together, like 3,9-HJ, because we don't know where it fits. It's not coupling into anything. But they're also going to be the sources of tremendous strength because those isolated ones are then going to link to the other isolated parts. So let's start with the carbonyl. The carbonyl is 5B to, six, uh, to, to 1 and 6D and 6E to 1, and that's very, very useful. The, so remember, HMBC can pick up two and three bond coupling, and the problem is you don't necessarily know which is which. That's the really tough thing with this technique. Later on, we'll talk about inadequate, which is a very powerful technique. It's like a carbon-carbon cozy, but not a very useful technique because of the low natural abundance of C13. You, it's very, very atypical to have two C13s next to each other in a molecule. But that's incredibly powerful because it means you can assemble your whole carbon skeleton like a cozy process. But the problem with HMBC is you've got both two and three, so you're always second guessing yourself. So whenever you can avoid second guessing, it's a tremendous breath of fresh air. So here, the 5B five, five to carbon one is very nice because that provides a linkage there. We kind of sort of knew this was an ethyl ester. But this tells us, because there's the three bond coupling is going through there, so it can't go any further. There can't be an intervening atom. The six is less clear because it could be directly connected, but at this point I can't know. There could be an intervening atom that still, we know that the six is isolated. We know that D and E are isolated. They're not J coupled to anything else, but I don't know about this bond here at this point. So at this point, I might write a big question mark here. All right, I'm not going to go ad nauseum through everything because a lot of the information is redundant. So for example, here we're seeing, we're seeing that two is crossing with seven. So this is eight F cross two. 10 G cross 2 and 7 H to 2. And in a way, you could say all of that is redundant because I've already, I've already placed groups on here. And so your two, you notice, and this is a perfect example, if I weren't already sure of this or pretty sure by a little coupling, I wouldn't necessarily know, since 2 is crossing with both 7H and 8F, I wouldn't necessarily know which end this is going because it's 2 and 3 bond coupling, so it could couple either way. 
So the only thing that's really told me this, and I think by this point I can go ahead and turn this into, into a uh, solid line. The only thing that really told me that was the cozy. But fortunately, we'll get enough other things because we're going to see in just a moment what attaches over here to 7. All right, so let's focus, let's continue to focus on our isolated peaks. So if we look at 4, and we go with 4, we have 9j to 4. We have 7h to 4. We have 6d and e, and maybe the better way to do it is 6de to 4. And we have c to 4. Now, all right, we have four, and we're pretty sure, at this point, we're pretty sure we have this alcohol. We're pretty sure that C is, is the alcohol. It's isolated. I think at this point, we really can say, all right, here's our HC. We're on four. Now, Four is going to be a very, very important linchpin. And I guess the thing that's confounding to me at this point is the fact that we've got 9J to 4, but that's not necessarily saying that that isolated methyl is directly attached to 4. We're running out of atoms, so we're going to be good in a second. We have 7 to 4. We have 6D and E to 4. They're probably all attached. But watch what happens if I now pick up on another isolated one. So I probably can start to infer things. But let's continue with another one of our problem children, another one of our isolated ones. So let's go off of C. We wouldn't be seeing cross peaks off of C if it were exchanging rapidly, if the alcohol on C were not residing on that proton, on that oxygen for you know several hundredths or a tenth of a second if it were exchanging rapidly. Usually the less sterically congested an alcohol, the more rapidly it exchanges. So usually a primary alcohol exchanges rapidly. Usually sometimes a second is secondary is slow, sometimes it's fast. Usually a tertiary tends to be slower, just more steric congestion, harder for a molecule of water to get in and make it exchange. Deacidify your chloroform, pass it through alumina not your sample, but just your chloroform through flame or furnace dried alumina. It's a good way to reduce exchange because you're getting rid of acid in the sample. But here we happen to see beautiful, beautiful coupling off of C. And so if you look at your cross peaks here, and again, we're going to use things in this focused way. We have C9, C7, C6, and so you look at all of these these cross peaks, and that, that really is nice. Because remember, you're, you're going to be picking up your two and three bond coupling. Unless you have any intervening coupling through a double bond where sometimes you can pick up four bond coupling. Remember, sometimes like acetylenes, we saw how weird the acetylene behaved. I mentioned it's a two bond, it's a 50 hertz coupling, so you can get homopropargilic coupling. But here, the <coughs> This is pretty nice. We've already taken care of two of our bonds. So look how valuable this is as a linchpin. Every cross peak now we get is going to help give us our connectivity. So we have C4. That's going to connect over to C6 because we're getting that cross peak here. So we know that this is three bond. That's as far as we can go. We're really lucky at this point. Now we get this cross peak over to 7. And so again, that's just sewing this whole molecule together. We have this cross peak to 9. And we said already here, remember, we had this fragment. We weren't able to place it. But it could be redundant because we were running out of carbons. We have this cross peak over to 9. And so there's our C9, H3. J, and now this whole molecule is sewn up. So if you look at our structure right now, 
And I'll just redraw this. And I guess I'll draw it real small up here. So here's, here's the whole structure of our molecule. We have our 7 and 8 over here, our 6 here, our ethyl group, our isolated methyl, our isolated hydroxy. And this, this set of cross peaks here has really been key. Now the good news is there are other isolated points in this molecule that can put things together. So when I try to attack a problem, I'm going to start with the isolated ones. Obviously, eventually you want to go back and sort of check yourself and see that everything's consistent. But let's take another point of attack here. So let me just run down this track of 9J nine, nine and see who 9J is crossing with. So 9J is crossing with um, 7. 9J is crossing with 6. And 9J is crossing with 4. And so you look at that and you say, oh, OK, that's giving me this same information. See, the HMBC is really screaming out at me through the isolated ones. It was a gift that we got HC. HC might not have coupled. It's an alcohol. HC might have been exchanging rapidly if there was some acid in our sample. It was a gift that we got it. It just gave us the whole problem. But we get that same gift right off of carbon 9, because 9 with J is giving us 7. So we're crossing over to here. And again, remember, your hydrogen, you have one bond from hydrogen J to carbon, one bond from carbon 9 to carbon 4. And so any other cross peak now has to be attached directly to carbon 4. So we see a cross to 7. We see a cross to 6. And we see across to four, that's our two bond coupling. So that's giving us the information. I'll take one more isolated carbon just for the, for the heck of it. It's not really completely isolated, but it's, it's 10G. And so if we go off of 10G, let's see, we have here 10G with three and 10G with eight over there. And so if you look at that, that's also giving us some information. We had the 10G to 3 biallelic coupling by the proton NMR. So that information was nothing new. But you don't get allylic coupling right through here. So, so this information here of 10G to 8 is actually useful. Had we not been able to place, had we not been able to place 8 directly on 2, had we not picked up that allylic coupling, or had things been more complicated or confusing, or had we only at that point had this HMBC cross peak between 2 and 7 and 8, remember how I said 2 is crossing with both, um, is crossing with both HF and HHH, and we couldn't be, be sure about that. If I, if I wasn't certain at that point, then we could have gotten that later on um, from this cross peak. So there's multiple pieces of evidence all pointing in this direction. Anyway, this is how I view HMBC as being incredibly powerful for putting pieces together. I want to show you a couple of last things that are sort of common common features that are kind of, kind of cool. They're also germane to, uh, to some of the upcoming homework, so it's, it's worth actually keeping in mind. One thing that's very cool is, OK, if you have two CH3s on a methyl, so remember how I said you can get these vampire bites, you can get your one bond couplings. But if you're going ahead and if you have no stereocenter, in other words, if these methyls are either not diastereotopic or they're coincident, then your HMBC, even if you see these vampire type, bite type of cross peaks here, even if you see, so here's your methyl and here's your, your methyl in the C13, here's your methyl in the H1, 
even if you see those types of cross peaks, this is a real HMBC cross peak here because the two methyls are crossing with each other. So that's kind of cool. Well, in this particular cartoon example, they're magnetically equivalent. If they were magnetically inequivalent, if they were diastereotopic, then you'd still see HMBC peaks. By the way, the tough thing about HMBC is you're not guaranteed to get a cross peak because you're di particularly on three bond. So two bond is weird because your two bond J's end up being all over the map. They'll usually show up, but not always. Three bond is weird in a different way. It's weird by a dihedral angle, by a carpalus relationship. So if you're two, if you're hydrogen, so if you have a dihedral angle that's defined as HCCC, like so, if you have good overlap between this hydrogen and this carbon, a good geometrical overlap, meaning an anti-periplanar or a syn-periplanar relationship, you typically get a big J. It shows up in the HMBC. But if these two are at close to 90 degree angles, you're not going to get a cross peak typically. And so that's the third thing about HMBC that's really confusing. The beauty of methyl groups is with a methyl group, no matter what, you're always going to have at least, you're always going to have protons at a good dihedral angle. So methyl groups, isolated methyl, well, methyl groups in general, end up being extremely valuable for HMBC. But we also see here that the isolated methyl groups are usually the problem children because you don't know where to put them. And fortunately, they are talkative problem children because they will talk to you in the HMBC. So that's a very useful one. A couple of other things just to keep in mind. Carbonyls, if you've got like this, if you've got something like this, whatever, you know, the problem is you don't know if it's two bond coupling or three bond coupling, but if you can build up your pieces and say, oh, well, I've got both of them, then you can figure out, all right, that carbonyl's attached to one and the other. Um, let's see, I guess, I don't know if this comes up. We already saw an ester. Some people have said to me, oh, I didn't know that you could get coupling through heteroatoms. But yeah, coupling occurs through carbon-oxygen bonds, through carbon-carbon bonds, through carbon-nitrogen bonds. So for example, in an amide here, like so, again, your carbonyl can be a real linchpin. You can get all different protons coupling with that carbonyl. So they can, they can end up telling you lots and lots of information for putting the pieces together. But what's nice is carbonyls often isolate one spin system from another spin system. And it's those isolated spin systems, what I'm calling fragments, that are so hard to put together. And that's why HMBC is so valuable as a focus tool. All right, this should give you the skills to attack the problems, not for this week's homework set, but for the next week's homework set where the molecules are going to get more complicated and where you're going to be more dependent on being able to systematically put your pieces together. Is that, is that example that we just did? Sorry. Um, yeah. Is that, um, there's no way to determine stereotype. You couldn't tell, great question. James is asking, could we tell the stereochemistry of our center? No, the racemate would have the exact same spectra as the one enantiomer or the other enantiomer. The only way to differentiate them would be to add something chiral, to make a Mosher ester here, for example, with a chiral derivatizing agent, or to use what's called a chiral shift reagent, which I haven't planned a section on for our course, but it's basically a Lewis acid that's chiral that will interact with the two enantiomers differently. So you need chirality to distinguish chirality.